crowding is, is an interesting, you know, if you want to call it a risk factor, uh, it's hard to measure. Uh, you can look at 13Fs, you can look at hedge fund holdings, uh, retail positioning, but often hard to quantify um, without a true measure of everyone's position or without, without positioning data. Um, so yeah, it, it's an interesting, uh, interesting point to bring up. And I wanted to ask you about performance. I know you mostly deal with sort of futures type strategies. What are you noticing in terms of performance on uh, the strategies that you uh, that you delve in? Um, I, th I think it's to go back to your point about defensiveness of uh, certain futures based strategies. I think it's this year is a case in point. Uh, it's been weak and it's been a roller coaster. So trend following, for instance, which always has some sort of defensive component, has been suffering. It had a great Q1, and then it has been subject to reversals and actually very sharp drawdowns uh, during the year. Um, on the other hand, uh, what I should say is that people who manage portfolios, diversified portfolios of which this is only one part, know exactly what to expect and know what uh, they have in the rest of their portfolio. So very often, they don't have just a very narrow view on the performance of these strategies. They know how their fixed income book is doing, how their equity book is doing, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if they are disappointed, let's say, by the performance this year in certain parts of those alternative strategies, they will know that their equity book is doing fabulously well. And they would also know that in another year, maybe when both fixed income and equities go down, like it was the case in 2022, the alternative strategy will fill that particular bucket and will provide that diversification. So I think it's very important to keep all these things in perspective and to look at the portfolio on a very broad basis. Yes, no, uh, in interesting point, and thanks for your insight. Yeah, I wanted to um, discuss something you mentioned about risk and how it's associated uh, and rel relative to our traditional risk premium strategies. So one of the issues with your risk premium strategies is more like tail risk um, or correlation in the tails, where we may see you know, value and quality negatively correlated in a typical environment. Uh, however, when there's a shock to the market or shock to the system, we notice that, uh, you know, the correlation will increase on something that initially appeared negatively correlated. And um, I want to get a sense of how you sort of deal with that, maybe measure that, um, and how do you sort of address that for periods of market shock. And maybe, Samara, you could uh, uh, walk us through some of your, uh, some of your thoughts and insight. Um, so when it comes to these tail correlations, and uh, as a matter of fact, to any surprises, uh, we should see like how sudden they are un unfolding. Uh, is it really sudden or the information is already out there and we are not capturing those? Um, there is a recent paper from Cliff Asmussen uh, published in August talking about uh, markets uh, becoming less efficient in the past 30 years, uh, which the implication will be uh, we're going to have these shocks even unfold more gradually. So at the end of the day, who has built better systems that capture those shocks quicker than others? And they can detect the source of those shocks and take the proper action on those, like uh, the risking of the portfolio, whether they want to like stay the course or um, take the other side of the bet, or uh, tilt to other idiosyncratic factors that are less impacted by the shocks, um, those are going to be the winning strategy. From the risk model perspective, uh, most of these models are not able to capture all the factors. And uh, they are really calibrated on the history when it comes to the tail correlations. Uh, there are not enough data points. And uh, even the current system they are usually calibrated on fundamental shocks. So when it comes to liquidity crisis, like the quant event of 2007, when uh, some of these pharma French factors, they had um, really tail correlation. Uh, 
those cases are like very extreme for the risk system. Uh, there was a, I think in 2007, in four days, there was 25% drop, um, uh, drawdown in uh, volatility and momentum factor. That's 30 standard deviation uh, event per year. Uh, so it, for us, uh, as a like pension plan, we look at these style factors as a um, another layer of diversification and to broader diversified portfolio. Like uh, you mentioned, uh, we have uh, diversified across geographies, asset classes, private, public assets. So if there is going to be a day that these style factors are not going to perform. Uh, and they're going to be positively correlated uh, in their tail end, uh, we accept those uh, sort of negative impact and we hope that there is uh, enough resilience in the rest of the portfolio to uh, cushion the blow. Uh, for some of the fundamental factors, we have in-house uh, systems built that they are able to uh, shock these fundamental factors to the extremes they are built to uh, basically model the time varying correlation among the assets so they can do really like extreme scenarios and provide us with uh, more insights and colors where we are vulnerable and where we have to make the portfolio more resilient. Uh, having said those, there are some research that they look into managing the co skewness of the uh, these style factors for the tail, um, those are, I think, promising, but I haven't personally looked into those yet. Yeah, I've read some research on managing tail risk. They, you can do it with the copula, or you can assume a different type of distribution at the tails. But as you said, uh, it's limited data. Um, it's not necessarily ingrained in the risk model, so you need a different type of distribution. Um, any other panelists want to chime in on how to manage tail risk or measure tail risk? I think it also depends on how quickly the shock takes place, right? So if it's a more gradual shock, which perhaps you can use some kind of regime switching model, but if it happens instantaneously, it's really hard to predict that. And so in that case, uh, as Samir mentioned, you just want to look back historically and see, you know, what are the incidences of, of those tail risk behavior and how comfortable do you feel with that kind of risk in your portfolio? And if you don't feel comfortable, then you should perhaps scale back on that risk. Um, I think that's probably the, the best approach. I've seen some research where you sort of tighten the correlation calculation window to capture more recent uh, correlation in the market. But it, you know, it has other effects like leading to higher turnover, et cetera. So I think it's a, it's a difficult uh, problem to solve. Um, Eric, do you want to chime in? Yeah, maybe a, a few thoughts because it's, uh, it's a kind of a topic we're actually working on. Um, so, one, one thing I would say first is, is just um, uh, awareness. Uh, awareness in the sense that, uh, that many investors um, look at correlation, which is a kind of a linear measure, so they look at the entire kind of time series of return and they look at uh, the average correlation or some type of an average co-movement uh, among whatever pieces they have. Uh, and that number could be misleading because when you think about tail, then you're asking really what happens in very uh, specific situation. And um, if you take um, even kind of very simple, straightforward type of factors or signals and so on, and you look at the whole history, and then you look at specific periods, the result could be very uh, different. So first thing is just to be aware of the deficiencies of some of the measures people use and, and use the right measures and focus on, uh, on tail events. and. Um, we don't have many of them. That's part of the um, statistical problem that, uh, that we don't have enough data. But there's, there's a few, right? There's a few periods over the last three, four decades. So that would be a good start, uh, just to, to look at that and understand um, what were the magnitudes in those cases. Now, the next thing is, OK, let's say you have that uh, and you're aware. Uh, what can you do about it? Uh, so I think that the um, uh, this view that you could estimate something very accurately is somewhat presumptuous because uh, you just don't have the data. And um, even if you do, you never know if it's going to work. Uh, if you think about the COVID crisis we had, uh, or the COVID dynamic, um, very different than what we had before. It was an unfinancial driven event. 
uh, with some are pending in the market, what were considered less risky suddenly became very risky because it was kind of more the brick and mortar type companies and those that were more remote, uh, high tech companies that were seen as more risky suddenly became less risky uh, for, for a period of time at least, right? So, so there's things that we just don't know, we can't control, we have to acknowledge, that, that's a given. So I would say, first of all, is awareness. Number two is kind of modesty, we need to know. But then there is, uh, I would say, I wouldn't stop there, right? So what we are trying to work on and um, is trying to identify ways uh, or measures that are ex ante as opposed to ex post. Meaning, if you think about return, those are already ex post. Uh, this reflects already trading by, 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 by investors and things that happen. So if you're looking at returns in the market, you're already looking in the back mirror. You need to look at things that are happening before they filter into returns, right? Could be different dynamics in the market. Uh, the way things trade and, 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 um, and, and other action by investors uh, that may be, uh, may be indicating things are out of control or things are, are uh, not behaving in a way that, uh, that is kind of normal. And those would be leading indicators. And when you see those, then, then it means that you need to kind of be much more cautious and you know, then you need to decide whether you want to scale down risk and, and so on. But uh, again, rather than looking in the back mirror and, and looking at uh, changing correlation of return, that, that's too late already. I mean, you've got to do something else. Um, so uh, to me, that would be the, the third, third uh, element here. Yeah, please go ahead. Maybe just to echo what you said, I think it's possible to take into account this tail dependence. And by tail dependence, to go back to basics, it's uh, if you have two assets and they may look fairly uncorrelated in normal conditions, but somehow you happen to be in October of 08, November of 08, and then everything goes down together. And you find that in the extreme parts of the distribution, you are investing and you're trying to apply Murphy's law to portfolio construction because when something goes wrong, everything goes wrong. Well, there are statistical tools for that, uh, but it, it means that, you, like Eric said, you need to inject some views because you may not have enough data points in the past. So you have to engage in the difficult uh, exercise of scenario building and having a view. And what you said earlier about uh, copulas, which is a, a heavy-handed object, can be extremely practical. Why? Because you can say, well, maybe this sector or this particular risk premium, let it be value or momentum, has fatter tail than the other. Well, how do I measure it? Maybe my risk is more asymmetric on the downside than on the upside. So you can have views that you can express relatively simply on the behavior of each of your assets in the portfolio. Maybe not stock specific, but at least country or industry specific or risk premium specific. And then put them together to have something where you have tail dependence. The problem becomes that um, do your risk management or portfolio construction tools can they embed these sort of simulation views? Um, it is possible. Um, maybe not. Maybe you have to, buy, to build something from scratch. One of the issues, though, is that if you focus and incorporate the tail risk into your portfolio construction, is there not an additional risk that you are going to become excessively defensive? Because you start caring about the third standard deviation or the fifth standard deviation to the downside. So it becomes an agency problem as a PM. 